So in this lecture, we'll study the Maxwell equation. We'll cover the Maxwell equation in two parts. So this is part one of the Maxwell equation, and the in part two will be covered in the coming one hour lecture. The relevant section in your book are section 9.5 and section 9.7. So if we talk about the static and dynamic EM field, we have we have already discussed discussed this in the previous work, lecture. So stationary charges are the sources of electrostatic field. So if we have a stationary charge, let's say plus Q charge, then there will be an electrostatic field around that charge, moving radially outward. So and static means that it is not a function of time. Electric field will be uh, at every point in space will be a vector. And it will be a function of X, Y and Z. So this is the example of electrostatic field and the sources of these are stationary charges. So these are the cause and this is the effect. So this is cause. And this is the effect. Next. If we have charges are moving with uniform velocity or we have the DC current case, these are the sources or the cause of the magnetostatic field. So for example, if we have some current flowing through some DC wire, so if we have a wire and DC current is flowing through it, then according to Ampere's law, there will be a magnetic field circulating. If I use the right hand rule, then this will be direction of magnetic field. So there will be a circulating magnetic field around this wire. And it will be again a magnetostatic field. So it's a vector and a function of X, Y, and Z, but not a function of time. So these are the example of electrostatic and magnetostatic field. The third category is the Time vary is the uh, electromagnetic field or dynamic. We call them dynamic field, electromagnetic field, or time varying field. So the sources of electromagnetic field or time varying electromagnetic field. We should say that these are the time varying electromagnetic field. Are the time varying current or AC currents? And in we will see in the that for time varying electromagnetic field, electric field will be a function of X, Y, Z, and as well as time. Similarly, magnetic field will also be a function of X, Y, Z, and time. These are basically vector functions. These are vector and the functions of space as well as time coordinates. We will see that for time varying EM field, electric and magnetic field cannot exist independently. Time varying electric field will generate a time varying magnetic field, and time varying magnetic field will generate time varying electric field. So these two exist in pairs. In electrostatic, electric field can exist independently. We don't need the magnetostatic field for, for existence of electrostatic field. Similarly, for our existence of magnetostatic field, we don't need this electrostatic field. But for time varying field, electrostatic, time varying electric and magnetic field exists in pairs. They cannot exist independently. The basic of all the electromagnetic phenomena are the Maxwell equation. So the Maxwell equation are nothing but the observation and experimental work of different EM phenomena, some physical insight and vector calculus leading to some fundamental laws of electrostatic and magnetostatic, let's say uh, Gauss law, uh, Faraday's law, as well as Ampere's law. So these are the four Maxwell equations, which are the building blocks of 
all the em phenomena these are the basis of or the starting point of this course so so in maxwell equation there are two types of quantities there are field quantities that is e h d and b and there are our source quantities that is this j and as well as this rho so source quantity are the cause you can think them as the as cause and the field quantity are the effect so the field quantities are there are four field quantities in the maxwell equation the first is electric field strength or electric field intensity or e and it is its unit is volt per meter the second is electric flux density vector and its unit is coulomb per meter square third is magnetic field strength or magnetic field intensity and its unit is ampere per meter then we have b or magnetic flux density which is measured in vapor per meter square or in tesla and for as far as the source quantities we have two types of source quantity electric charge density denoted by rho v having units of coulomb per meter cube and electric current density denoted by j having unit of ampere per meter square so for field quant quantities please remember that we have <coughs> e field vector e and electric field density vector d so these two are the first two uh, this is also called the electric field intensity electric field density but i i will simply use uh, call this electric field vector and i will call this d uh, electric field density vector then for h i will use h field vector and denoted by denoted this with h and h field or magnetic field density vector and it is will be denoted by this b obviously this e d h and b are all function of space and time so this e is actually a function of space x y z and as well as time so this is the short end notation of this thing so this does not mean that it is uh, it is not a function of space and time this so you always think it e as a shortcut notation of this x y z and t so this is convenient to write so next uh, my question is all the these we have four field quantities are these are uh, independent or they are dependent how many de uh, independent quantity we have no answer so actually we have two dependent quantities uh, two uh, two independent quantities because d and e are related to each other by d is equal to epsilon v and b and h are also related to each other so these two are related to each other by d is equal to epsilon e and these two are related to each other by b is equal to mu h we have two independent quantity so then there is a constitutive relation which basically describe the em field interaction with matter so we have three constitutive relations given by these equation here the first is d is equal to epsilon e and second is b is equal to mu h and third is j is equal to sigma e. here epsilon mu and sigma are the constitutive parameters and these two these three relations are known as constitutive 
relations and epsilon is the permittivity epsilon is the permittivity mu is what what is mu it is the permeability and what about this sigma ye kya cheez hoti hai jo what is this sigma conductivity conductivity and this epsilon is related to this this epsilon is by definition epsilon not time epsilon not epsilon not is the the permittivity of free space it's a constant and epsilon r is the relative permittivity or simple we call this the dielectric constant what is this unit of this dielectric constant kya hoti hai iski unit what is the unit of this epsilon not it's a unitless it does not have any unit similarly this mu here permeability is related is equal to mu not time mu r mu not is the permeability of free space and mu r is the relative permeability and the value of mu not and epsilon not are given by these number mu not is 4 pi into 10 to the power minus 7 henry per meter and epsilon not is 8.854 into 10 to the power minus 12 farad per meter please note that epsilon r and mu r does not have any units free space epsilon r is 1 and mu r is also 1 so these two relation the first two relation will become simply these two relation will become epsilon epsilon r will become 1 and mu r will become 1 we have then d is equal to epsilon not e and b is equal to mu not h and mu epsilon not and mu not are given by these two numbers now my question is in free space what will be the value of j can anybody tell me what will be the value of j in free space basic relation is this j is equal to sigma e in free space what will be the value of j so ke zara bataye kya j ki kya value hogi the anyone what will the value of sigma for free space no answer j zero hoga sir j will be zero because this in free space the the conductivity is zero and j will be zero so good this this is this was the answer i was expecting in free space j will be zero so this information we will use later on in this in the course we will use j is equal to zero in free space and for in free space d will become epsilon not e and b will become mu not h so maxwell equation come into two forms first is the integral form given by this relation these four relation and then we also have a differential form so this first equation that a d dot ds closed loop surface integral is equal to charge in closed this is basically gas law of electrostatic and this second relation that b dot ds closed loop surface integral is equal to zero is magnetic gas law which basically tell there is a no isolated magnetic charge this third relation is what is this third relation can anybody tell me
what this thing is e dot dl closed loop line integral what this thing represent voltage or potential what this thing b dot ds this was the flux what is this thing the voltage is equal to minus rate of change of flux what is what what is the law which state that faraday law faraday law this is the statement of faraday's law and what about this ross relation closed loop line integral h dot dl is equal to ampere law this is the ampere's law now in ampere's law ampere's law was Uh, this h dot dl this was the ampere's law h dot dl closed loop line integral equal to i in close so this this term here is basically i in close or i what is the role of this second term here what this doing what is this the purpose of this second term can anybody tell me Ampere, ampere level, or I should make this zero because it is not consistent with ampere law. If you recall from the EMF T course, this term is called the displacement current term. So this term is the displacement current. Yes, any sir, distance will not be added again. Ah, uh, and this this current actually was the conduction current. So, what is the role of displacement current? So, to understand this, so when Ampere's law Ampere's law was studied by the Maxwell, uh, he came across a problem which is called the sometimes uh, referred as capacitor paradox. uh so this is the example of uh, that problem so we have a simple state conducting wire and it, an ac current is flowing through this wire and there is a capacitor attached uh, in between in, inside this wire in, in series so when uh, maxwell applied the ampere law so th this is closed loop line integral so we can apply this let's say this is our closed loop line integral but for every closed loop line integral we can also associate a surface so in this case the surface is s1 but the surface does not need to be the argument of maxwell was that the surface does not need to be a simple a plane it can also be a three dimensional surface Uh, let's say that this type of bulging surface so in one case maxwell take this surface and in second case for same calculating the ampere law at the dl is closed loop line integral he take this three dimensional surface passing through this center capacitor center plane so this is surface s2 now for, for first case there is a current inter penetrating through this surface so i in close comes out to be right hand side comes out to be of ampere's law comes out to be some non zero value i but for this case this second choice of surface which is three dimensional surface i in close is zero because there is no current or penetrating through this three dimensional surface so this was the problem which was maxwell was working so then maxwell make an experimental arrangement and measure the magnetic field between the capacitor plates and he found that magnetic field is non zero in both the cases so there is something is wrong with uh, this i in close is equal to zero so, so although theoretical i in close is zero but practically there is some magnetic field uh, at dl dl exists between the plates 
can he modify the mps law his argument was that in faraday's law a changing magnetic field produce a a changing or circulating electric field so in similarly uh, his argument was that we should modify the mps law that a changing electric field uh, a term similar to this term so if you note closely this term was partial b by partial t term was already existed in the faraday's law and this partial d by partial t term the changing electric field term this is the term which introduced was introduced by the maxwell to correct this issue so he introduced this term and uh, this makes the mps law correct for both these two cases so this this term is known historically known as the displacement current and in circuit theory we do not uh, usually bother about the displacement current or conduction current what is the reason of that what should be the uh, value of conduction and displacement current how they should be related to each other are they equal conduction displacement current should be less or greater than the conduction current kya hona chahiye it comes out that conduction current ic is equal to displacement current its magnitude are equal so that's why we do not bother this in circuit theory because it, their magnitudes are equal so we just consider that the conduction current in circuit theory because both are uh, these two terms are equal so we also have a differential form of maxwell equation in addition to this uh, integral form so we have two divergence equations delta d is equal to rho v and delta b is equal to zero which are basically gauss law for electric and magnetic field and then we have two curl equations curl of e is equal to minus rate of change of p and curl of h is equal to j plus partial d by partial t so these are faraday's ampere law so these four maxwell equation two curl equations and two divergence equation are the basics of all the em and microwave engineering circuits and phenomena so one question here is comes out to be that if we are given the this integral form of maxwell equation how can we convert to differential form to convert from integral to differential form we need these two theorems the first is called the stoke theorem which basically relate the closed loop line integral to surface integral and this the second theorem is the divergence theorem which relate the closed loop surface integral to volume integral so closed loop line integral is equal to curl of a and whole surface integral so this is the stoke theorem and divergence theorem is closed loop surface integral is equal to divergence of a uh, and we can take its volume integral so these two theorem are useful one is relating the line integral to surface and the second is relating the surface integral to volume so if we know these two theorem we can easily convert uh, from integral form of maxwell equation to differential form of maxwell equations so let's take some example so these are two example so we want to obtain the differential form of maxwell equation and we are given the uh, this uh, integral form of maxwell equation this is the faraday's law uh, sorry gauss law and this is the faraday's law so we want to convert them into differential form so to convert into differential form we can first write this like this as d dot ds we can write this right hand side to as volume integral of rho v dv now on left hand side we have surface integral and on right hand side we have volume integral if we somehow convert this surface integral into volume integral 
then on then we have will have a volume integral on both the side so i am using the divergence theorem to convert the surface integral into volume integral so if i do so so i can write this this as using divergence theorem divergence of d volume integral dv equal to volume integral rho v dv now on we have both on both side we have volume integral we can simply compare them so we end up with divergence of d so this is our gauss law in differential form or which is also a maxwell equation let's take another example so this is the faraday's law in integral form we want to convert it into differential form so again uh, on left hand side we have line integral and on right hand side we have surface integral if we somehow convert this line integral into surface integral then we can equate both uh, both the sides so i am using the stoke theorem to convert this line closed loop line integral into surface integral so if we i uh, use the stoke theorem i can write this as curl of e ds surface integral equal to on right hand side i can write this as partial over partial t p dot ds now on both both side we have surface integral so we can compare if we compare these two we can write this as curl of e equal to what minus partial or partial minus partial partial t of b so this is the faraday's law in differential or point form this differential form is also known as point form so in this way using stoke and divergence theorem you can convert between the uh, uh, from integral form a form of maxwell equation to differential form so next we have a question here that if we are given the ampere's law so we have given this ampere's law generalized ampere law this is plus this maxwell modification Uh, displacement current density term and gauss law so can we prove the conservation of electric charge or the continuity equation with the help of these two equation so the conservation of charge or continuity equation can be proved using ampere's law and uh, gauss law using this procedure if we take the divergence of this first equation so i can write this as divergence of curl of h this is my left hand side and on right hand side we have divergence of j plus partial or partial t of divergence of d so i have taken the divergence on both side of this equation this ampere's law equation next can anybody tell me what will be the answer of this divergence of a curl of a vector zero three this answer is zero actually because curl mean physically that 
if we have a let's say circulating field purely circulating field which a magnetic field is obviously a purely circulating field so a skull will be maximum and the divergence on the other hand tells the number of lines entering and number of line leaving this so in this case if i take the small surface the number of line entering and number of line leaving are same so this means that it has no divergence so this is actually called the null identity of vector calculus that divergence of a curl of a vector is zero the proof of this is given in probably chapter 2 or 3 of your uh, textbook uh, so on left hand side we have this zero and on right hand side we have divergence of j plus if this divergence of d if i use this gauss layer divergence of d is equal to rho v so i can write this as partial of a partial t of rho v so in this next i can write this as divergence of j equal to minus partial of partial t of rho v so this is basically continuity equation which is basically conservation of charge there is one more point that maxwell equation for static for the case of static maxwell equations are two independent set so what is meaning of this for static what will be the what will this term will become can anybody tell me in electrostatic b will be what b will be only function of x y and z and if i take the derivative with respect to time what will be the answer it is constant zero zero yeah it's the answer is zero so i expect the you to answer this type of simple question so this partial or partial t of b b is constant with respect to time so this will become zero in electrostatic and this will become also zero so in electrostatic these two equations will become become one pair of set that uh, rho this will become the source of electrostatic and it is creating a diverging electric field okay and circ circulation of electric field is zero in electrostatic so this is complete set one complete set in second case the source of magnetostatic are this j or current current and it create a circulating magnetic field but the divergence of b is zero so this is again a complete set so we have a two independent set in electrostatic so this was the first set that divergence of d is equal to rho v and curl of e is zero and the sources of electrostatic are rho v and this has the cause and this is the effect and the second set is this loss one that divergence of b is zero and curl of e is j so j is the cause and it create a circulating magnetic field so this is the situation in electrostatic when there is a no then electric and magnetic field are not function of time or the frequency is zero on the other hand in dynamics or time in time varying electromagnetic field they, they are coupled with each other so they are coupled which they can they exist in pairs so for example if we have a time varying magnetic field it creates a circulating electric field time varying circulating electric field and time varying elect electric field will in turn create a circulating magnetic field which will also be a time varying then this time varying magnetic field will also create a time varying electric field so we this this phenomena will go forever so in time varying electromagnetic field a, a time time varying magnetic field create a circulating electric field 
and time varying then time varying electric field will create a circulating magnetic field and then we have again a time varying circulating electric field and then we again have time varying circulating magnetic field so this process will go forever so we will study this in detail uh, we will see that time varying electric and magnetic field are coupled they create a plane wave which propagate so we will have an electric field varying with function of, as a function of time then we will have a magnetic field so electric field is let's say is in this plane and magnetic field will be orthogonal to this so we will study this wave phenomena that time varying electromagnetic field are coupled together they create an em wave and which will flow by by carrying some power flow or energy in this for example in this z direction so remember that time varying electric and magnetic field exists in pairs so next we our objective is to put the maxwell equation in phasor form so what are the phasors kya hote hain phasors can anybody tell what are the phasors phasors are the complex numbers used to represent the magnitude and phase of a sinusoid so this was the fundamental definition of phasor that if we have a sinusoidal varying signal if we take its amplitude and phase and represent as a complex number then we call that complex number of phase so we want to represent the maxwell equation in the phasor form so it's better to revise the complex number first so a complex number let's say if we have a complex number c denoted by this red dot here and we have this real and imaginary plane so we can represent this complex number using three form the first form is called the rectangular form so is the real part is a let's say the real part of z is a and the imaginary part is b so we can simply write as z is equal to a plus j b so this is called the rectangular form we can also write this complex number using exponential form this r should be here so we can what we can do is that we can represent this complex number with this radius vector or this magnitude and a phase angle phi so if we write this complex number with this the uh, help of this r and phi so this is called the exponential form we can also write this c as r exponential of j phi phi is this phase and r is this magnitude from origin to the, this complex number c and phase is is taken in radian we sometimes also use the polar form which is basically short and rotation of this exponential j so this is the notation which is uh, used in the scientific calculator so you can just think it as a exponential form but this exponential j is replaced by this angle sign so so we have three form of complex number rectangular form exponential form and this polar form and if we want to convert from let's say rectangular to polar form let's say we are given the rectangular form let's say z is equal to a plus j b and we want to convert into this exponential form r and phi so what will be r here and what will be phi kya hoga r magnitude of a square plus b square plus b a square plus b square o square this is r and phi will be just is tan inverse b over a is this uh, 
so would pi will become tan inverse of b over a we got tan phi is b by a here now if we want to if our, we are given this rec, uh, polar or rectangular form let's say we are given z is equal to let's say r exponential of j phi and we want to convert back into rectangular form c is equal to a plus j phi. so if you remember the i identity so it was exponential j phi equal to cosine phi plus j sine phi if i multiply it with r let's say on both sides so this term is basically a plus j and this term is b so we can write as a is equal to r cos phi and b is equal to r sin phi so using these two equations we can convert for if we are given the exponential form we can convert back into this rectangular form or you can also you can either use this i identity or you can take just projection using geometrically so if i take the projection of r on the real axis it is r cos phi which is nothing but a and if i take the projection of r on this imaginary axis same thing both are same then we have r sin phi which is basically b so in this way we, you can convert between different form of complex numbers so if we take the we have to take the conjugate of complex number so in rectangular form this become minus j and in exponential form this phase phi become negative so physically if this is the complex number if we take its complex conjugate this phi become minus phi or in other word this plus jb will become minus j if we have to add two complex number then the rectangular forms are more useful we simply add the real part and add the the imaginary part separately similarly the operation can be done in the subtraction we subtract the real part and imaginary part separately if we have to multiply and divide the complex numbers then the polar or exponential form are more useful so if we multiply these two numbers z1 and z2 so magnitude this r1 and r2 will be multiplied and phase will be added on the other hand if we divide the two complex number the magnitude will be divided and phase will be subtracted so these are the basic information you already know now if we have to take the square root of a complex number uh, which we will use th this uh, will, will be required in the course later on so if we take the complex number let's say we assumed the this uh, exponential form so all you have to do is take the square root of magnitude and phase phi will become will be divided by 2 so this is the method of taking the square root of complex number so phase will be divided by 2 and the magnitude so you have to take the square root of this magnitude r so here are some useful relation which we will encounter during the course so let's say we want to find the the answer of these two relations so it is better let's say we have an exponential form let's say r exponential of j phi and let's say for the time being let's take the r is equal to 1 case so this will become 1 exponential of j phi so you can visualize this uh, exponential form like this let's say we have a real axis here and imaginary axis so if i take a unity circle let's say we have one here and we can consider this as exponential form as a vector rotating in the this complex plane so if you and this was our pi from the real axis so what should be the answer of this exponential of j pi by 2 when pi will be pi by 2 where will this vector will be located j we will be at this point so vector will be this 
So this answer of this will be J. What about exponential of minus J pi by two? Minus J. So this vector will be rotated and it will come here. So we have plus phi here, a minus pi minus 90. So this is actually minus J. So the answer of this is minus J. What about exponential of J pi? Minus one. So vector will be rotated and come here. So answer is here is minus one. And this one by J is actually minus J. So because if we multiply with J and divided by J, so J square is minus one. What about this square root of J? So this J was exponential J pi by two. So I can write this instead of this J, I am replacing it this exponential of j pi by 2 j pi by 2 and then i am taking the square root next what i can do square root mean that power of 1 by 2 so this become exponential of j pi by 2 time half or we have exponential of j pi by 4 so in this way, this is the square root of j. What will be the answer of this? J of j. Real or imaginary or complex. So you think about this. So this may conclude our lecture today. We will continue with this in the next class.